Good morning. It's good to see everyone this morning on this beautiful fall day. And uh, I think it's to begin with, we should uh, look to the Lord in prayer at this time. Father God, we love you and thank you for this time together. Thank you for each and every one here. Thank you, Father, for your love and the songs we've been singing concerning your love. Father, help us and bless us this morning as we uh, look into your word and we pray your blessings upon it downstairs with the classes going on there. And wherever your word goes out today, Father, we pray your blessings upon it. And as this message uh, goes out uh, uh, on YouTube, Lord, bless those who are listening uh, using that medium. Help us, Lord, and guide us to this day, we pray, and we love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a handout that Hannah is uh, passing out, and uh, there are also some pens and pencils if you need them. Hopefully we have enough. I think we do. Um, I'm going to be looking at the subject today of the heart of mankind, as you will see, those of you that have gotten the, the uh, handout. And uh, one of the things that uh, I like to do sometimes is have a handout like this and leave some blanks so that uh, you can fill those in. I think it means a little bit more than it. And uh, hopefully this is something you can take home. I know Walt said uh, something about homework this morning. He said, oh no, homework again. But I told him, no, if you if you're, do it right here, you can, you can uh, fill out the sheet right in the, in the, uh, during the service today. And uh, if you want, you can go home sometime and look this over and May it be a blessing to all those today. I just wanted to mention that uh, on, the, on the handout itself, you see uh, ten, 10 things there, 10 numbers at the top. And uh, the first six, if you want to just notice that the first six have to do with, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that have to do with uh, you and me personally and our faith and then number seven through ten is more of things that God uh, his part of the of the uh, study of um, the subject of the heart so um, that might be helpful too just as a way of uh, introduction and I didn't count these, but I, am, I understand that the Old Testament, in the Old Testament alone, the word heart occurs over 850 times. And that fact alone indicates the importance of the word heart and the idea of the heart and its role in the spiritual realm. The Bible reads out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I think that's interesting, isn't it? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Just as a way of introduction too, as we read these scriptures, you're going to notice that when, we, when, when scripture speaks to the heart or about the heart, I want you to think in terms, it's pretty simple, if you think in terms of the heart has to do with our passion, something that's very important to us, something that's very near and dear to the heart, so to speak. And, you know, if you think of uh, someone who is maybe pursuing a career and they really have a passion, they always say that to get to try to find an occupation that really, you know, appeals to you, and it's, it's something that you, you really you, you love it with your heart. Or if you are to find a life mate, you want to find someone who, you know, they really steal your heart, they say. You know, 
That's, that's something that's near and dear to you. So when we speak of our heart, we're speaking of something that is very near and dear. Now, there is a passage, and I don't have this on here, except I, I don't have it written on here, but Matthew, at the top of your sheet there, Matthew 22, 37 to 40, I'd like to read that. And it says there, first of all, 36 says, Teacher, it's a question of the Lord Jesus. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Verse 37, <clears throat> Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. The most important command, commandment, according to the Lord Jesus, is to love the Lord your God, that we are to love our Lord our God with all of our heart. And uh, again, uh, Deb and I were talking this morning about, you know, being on the earth, living here in this scene, and yet needing to love the Lord first. And when you're living on this earth and you are experiencing the things around you, the things of daily life, those have a tendency, don't they, to kind of take our minds off the Lord a lot of times. You know, and it doesn't mean they're bad things. It just means that the, the, the things of daily life take up our minds. And they, they, they uh, tend to uh, maybe make us forget about our love for the Lord. And yet, uh, you know, the Lord gave this as a standard, and it's good to have standards, isn't it? Now, <clears throat> it says in, uh, uh, Solomon wrote, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And the Amplified Bible reads that passage, Above all, guard your heart, for it affects everything you do. And I think sometimes we don't, at least I don't, stop and think about where, what is really in my heart? What, are, what is, you know, do I really have the Lord in my heart? Where is my heart? What is the passion? What is, what, what am I pursuing, you might say? What am I trusting? So I think it's good that uh, we stop and consider this topic a little bit today. Now, in Proverbs 4.4, 4, we're going to look at number one on the list. These are ten passages that refer to the heart. And obviously there are 860 in the Old Testament, so we're not going to cover them all today. That's for sure. I can guarantee you that. It says in Proverbs 4.4, 4, he also taught me and said to me, let your heart retain my words, keep my commands, and live. My son, give attention to my words, incline your ear to my sayings. Isn't that an interesting passage? So number one, we are to keep his words in our heart. And I know that we have some here that are involved in Bible B. What a wonderful thing that is, where we memorize God's word. And it's important, isn't it, to memorize and to learn God's word. But are his words kept in our heart or our minds? Or when we memorize God's word or when we read God's word, it's important that it's in our minds, but it, it needs to be in our heart. That's the point here. Keep God's words in your heart. Another passage says, um, Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence. Isn't it interesting how many passages there are about our heart? And you're going to see this over and over. Your heart, keeping the word of God in our heart, keeping the Lord Jesus in our hearts. 
in our minds. You know, it's not just our minds. It's our attention. In the midst of life, his words must change our behavior, need to change our behavior. Otherwise, we will just pursue what is selfish and and not of the Lord. So keep his words in your heart. Number two, I think this is an interesting passage. Mark 7, 19 and 20. For out of the heart proceed, and this is, this is not an easy one. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defiles not a man. You know, that was when he had, Jesus had that encounter with the, with the Pharisees, and they were saying, you know, you didn't wash your hands before you ate. And the Lord's response, obviously, was right here. He said, all kinds of things come out of our hearts. Washing your hands is you know, should be last on the list when you start to compare. You know, if you stop and think about it, our hearts are going to live forever. Your heart, your innermost being, will live forever. Um, You know, to think about what are we talking about with our heart? Well, the Hebrew and Greek meaning of the word in Scripture is the feelings the will, and even the intellect. It's the center of everything. Your heart is the center of everything in your life. And we're not referring, obviously, to your physical heart, but your spiritual well-being. The Latin word cardia, remember, you've heard that word before, cardio and all that, only this is spelled with a K, It means heart. They're the thoughts, the feelings, which are the soul and also the mind. The heart is the inner self that thinks, feels, and decides. Biblically speaking, the word heart has a much broader meaning than it does in our mind, in our modern language. The heart is that which is central to a person. Nearly all the references to the heart in the Bible refer to some aspect of human personality. So when you meet somebody, it doesn't take long if they speak and they tell you about their lives, you can see where, what's in their hearts, right? We reveal that when we talk to other people. What's your passion? What's your... You know, what makes you excited in life? And uh, that's what we're talking about here. But obviously, number two, the word is evil. Evil flows from the heart, doesn't it? The heart of man is evil. And, uh, you know... Our hearts live forever, as I mentioned. And the question is, is my heart right with God? Proverbs 6, 18 says, A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil. There's a lot of that in the world today, isn't there? Wicked plans. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And if you want to deny that, go ahead. But we all know it's true, isn't it? Our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the question is, or the point is that God knows it. He knows our hearts. Matthew 15, 8, for these people draw near to me, Jesus said, they draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So number two, evil flows from the heart. Not nice things to think about, but things that are important to think about when we get to number seven through ten. 
Number three. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness that's in their heart. Number three, we could have and we can have and we're born with a blind heart. Do you ever stop and think about that? We're born spiritually blind. We're born spiritually blind. And uh, when we talk about blindness, many times we are blind to the things around us that are stumbling, making us stumble and making us fall, aren't we? We are, we're blind to the truth. The truth is right in front of us. There's an expression, we can't see the forest through the trees, right? But we need to make sure we do not have a blind heart. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from God, the nearer we draw to the Lord, the more we have his light to illuminate our lives. Number four. Number four. Uh, Psalm 101, 4 and 5. A perverse heart shall depart from me. The one who has a haughty look and a proud heart him I will not endure. So the two words here are, we may have a perverse or a proud heart. What does that mean? What does that word perverse mean? It means showing a deliberate and obstinate desire to behave in a way that is unreasonable in spite of circumstances. I'll read that again. A perverse heart showing a deliberate and obstinate desire to behave in a way that is unreasonable in, a spirit, in the spirit of circumstances. We used to have a little boy that attended here, and I'm not going to mention his name, but we still use that example, Deb and I, when we, we think of it. We even have a kitty that has, we call it, this boy syndrome. And he would do anything to get attention. He, was, he did not have a, a good home life. He did not have an, uh, loving parents. And the, the, the poor kid was, but he would do anything, you know. He would act up. He would do things. He would throw things. He'd pick on others. And then he'd kind of look at you like that, like, are you looking? You know, do you see me? And he was just waiting for you to, don't do that, you know. Stop it. And uh, he was, he was, he had a, a perversion about him that, in that way. And uh, he ended up spending some time in prison later on. It was kind of a sad thing. But do I have a perverse heart, you know? Do I have a heart that deliberately does things that I, that I know I shouldn't do? And then there's a proud heart, and we're guilty of that, aren't we? A proud heart. We know what the scripture says about pride. A proud heart. And sometimes we're too proud to admit that we're wrong, aren't we? Sometimes we're too proud to humble ourselves before God and to listen to what, the, what God has to say to us. And we know that pride goes before destruction, as Scripture says. Number five. Number five. The verse is uh, uh, Proverbs seventeen eleven: An evil man seeks only rebellion. Therefore, a cruel messenger will be sent to him. We can have a rebellious heart, can't we? 
It's kind of the same, in a sense, of the perverse. We can have a rebellious heart. Uh, If you're a parent, or you've been uh, maybe on the bus, driving a bus, and I'm looking around the room here, or if if you've been in the classroom, just being a parent, whatever, we know that sometimes there are children who are rebellious. But sometimes it's not always children, is it? We rebel before God, don't we? Even though we're adults, we can be rebellious. I don't like this, God. I don't like what you're doing. I want to do it my way. A rebellious heart. Let's make sure we take account. Is my heart rebellious? Number six. I want to make sure I get to these last four because they're more positive, I think. But number six, it, uh, the passage is Exodus 7, 14. So the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard, and he refuses to let the people go. Pharaoh had a hard heart. Do not have a hardened heart. Like Pharaoh. Remember Pharaoh? He was going to let the Israelites go after the first plague. Then what happened? Got time for them to leave? Oh, you're not going. So there was another plague and another and another and another. And the more it went on, Pharaoh's heart got what? He got harder. He was just so defiant. He wasn't going to let them go. He was not going to let people, God's people go. You know, uh, there, there was one, and obviously we know what happened, don't we, with Pharaoh. It took God taking the eldest child in those families that didn't have the blood. And God, there were many, many, many Egyptian children that were their lives were taken that night and it took that to finally break Pharaoh's heart some of the words and some of the characteristics of someone who has a hard heart you might notice that they show no emotion they just show no passion or compassion or maybe they show fake emotion Or maybe they, you've heard people use the word, I don't care. I don't care. It doesn't bother me. I don't care. Maybe they have a lack of feeling or sympathy. Something happens where it's a tragedy that occurs and that person shows no feeling, no sympathy, no feeling, no compassion again, as I said. Another Example of a hardened heart is someone who is cynical. They just, you know, there's always uh, a cynical answer or reason for it. And then finally, those of us that have a hardened heart, we think the worst about people. We think the worst. And it says in Proverbs 21.2, every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs and examines the hearts of people and their motives. That's what it says in the Amplified Bible. Every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs and examines the hearts of people and their motives. God studies the hearts of man. Number seven. Number seven, God studies the hearts of man. And I just read that passage, I'm sorry, but that's all right. We're on number seven now. And that's why I wanted to get into this, because this is how God works in us. It says, God studies the hearts of man, Proverbs 21, 2. I just read that. Think about the Ten Commandments. What are the Ten Commandments? They are a standard for our hearts, right? It's God's standard for our hearts. 
the Sermon on the Mount, the teachings of the Lord Jesus, they're all related to our hearts. So number seven, God studies the hearts of man. Did you ever think about that? God studying your heart and studying my heart, what my motives are, what my attitude is. The Lord weighs and examines the hearts and their mo of people and their motives. So it starts with that. How do I follow God? How do I get my heart in the right place? It starts with number seven. God's studying. To realize he does study us and he cares. And he wants to change our hearts. Number eight. Moving along, what else does God do? Number eight, Proverbs 16, 1. There's a lot of verses here for number eight. Um, I have Proverbs 21, 2 there for number eight. No, wrong. Proverbs 16, 1. And I need to look that up because I don't have it. Proverbs 16, 1. Just a minute. And I'll read that to you. Solomon speaking to us. Proverbs 16, 1. The preparations of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. The preparations of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Some other verses there. Uh, Psalms 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Acts 16.14, One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. You see, God had prepared Lydia's heart. So the word for number eight, God prepares the heart. He wants to prepare your heart. He wants to prepare us for change. He wants to prepare our heart each day if we allow him to do so. And I think Lydia is a good example. Number nine, number nine. It says, God, or excuse me, Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy temple, God enlightens the heart. Oh, to have our hearts enlightened. You know, we were talking about blindness in number three, and this is the response to that, isn't it? God enlightens to be blind, but then to see. To have blindness, and then to have your vision restored. To have darkness and to have light. God enlightens our hearts, doesn't he? Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your, your ear to hear. He can enlighten us through seeing and through hearing, can't he? Then finally, number 10. And the question is, are our hearts enlightened? Number 10, God gives us, and it says in Ezekiel 36, 26 to 28, and I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart I will put my spirit in you so that you will carefully follow my decrees and be to 
and to obey my regulations. This is the goal we should all have, isn't it? He wants to give us a new, a tender, and a responsive heart. What a blessing. What a blessing to have a new, a tender, and a responsive heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will take, your, take out your stony, stubborn heart. There you see a heart transplant. Isn't that amazing? The Lord does heart transplants. He wants to take out that old, stony, stubborn heart and give us a tender and responsive heart. And he puts his spirit in us so that we can carefully follow his decrees. You know, Psalm 51.10 says, Create in me a clean heart. You have that on your note sheet. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. See all these ways that God can change us and renew us and make us new creatures in Christ. Matthew 5, 8. I think all of you or most of you could fill this in without me even saying it, right? Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Oh, to have a pure heart. My motives, my wants, my desires to be pure. And then there's a couple of quotes there. It says, an honest man, this is A.W. Pink, who was an evangelist from years ago. I found this quote from him. An honest man seeks to please God in all things and offend him in none. An honest heart. Do we have an honest heart? A heart that desires to please God in everything we do and offend him in none. And then Oswald Chambers, Chambers, the man or woman who does not know God demands an infinite, anybody know the word? It'd be hard to guess this one. An infinite satisfaction. The man or woman who does not know God demands an infinite satisfaction from other human beings, which they cannot give. And in the case of the man, he becomes tyrannical and cruel. It springs from this one thing. The human heart must have satisfaction. But there is only one being who can satisfy the last abyss of the human heart. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we don't put our hope in any one person or being. And we never should. Doesn't matter who it is. If it's a political figure, if it's a husband or wife or friend, our hope in our heart, if we want true satisfaction, it must hope in God. It must hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then if you remember the verse I read at the beginning, the verses when Jesus read, when Jesus answered this question, when we read in Matthew 22, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and your mind. And then that last passage, and I know we all know this, or most of us do, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. In the world we live in today, it's a world of troubled hearts, isn't it? There's a lot of trouble and a lot of trial. But I love this verse and I love this promise. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or rooms or dwelling places. 
If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. This is such a blessing if we just stop and think about it. Jesus is saying to you today, do not let your heart be troubled. No matter what it is that you're concerned with, no matter what trial or trouble you have, believe in, if you believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus is saying. Why do you think Jesus takes time to talk about these mansions in glory? You might think, you know, why does he do that? Why does he talk about, and specifically, and he talks about how he's going to prepare a place for us. Why does he do that? Why doesn't he just say, you know, trust me, I love you, you can go to heaven someday. But he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I have a place for you. I am the great contractor. You know, you've ever thought about your dream dwelling place? Well, the Lord, the great contractor, the greatest of all, is up there now preparing a place for you. And he says, I will, if I go, and he did go, if I go and prepare this place, I'm coming back. And I'm going to receive you to myself. That where I am, what? There you may be also. Where I go, you know, and the way you know. And of course, we could go on with that because they question, and we don't know where you're going, you know, why are you going, you know? But we know, don't we? And I would just say today, no matter what's going on in your life, don't let your heart be troubled. Because God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is working on your eternal dwelling place. I can't explain that. I can't even describe it. I wouldn't even try. But if you think you've seen some beautiful dwelling places, there is a dwelling place that he's preparing. And the beauty of it isn't the place. It's that our Savior is there, isn't it? That's, that's our hope. And I know, as I said before, it's easy to be troubled in the world we live in today. It's easy to be, to get uh, discouraged, to get uh, beat up. Maybe we're even beating ourselves up. But he's coming back, and he's going to take us to glory. But we must put our faith and trust in him. Our heart must, he must uh, come and come into our lives and our souls. You know, there's, they used to sing a song called Into My Heart, Lord Jesus. And I know that as far as in Scripture, there is no verse that says Jesus comes into your heart. Not exactly. There is not. But there are references about the Spirit of God. When we receive him, the Spirit of God dwells in our hearts. And he changed our hearts and our lives. So I would say when you pray, pray that the Spirit of God would reveal these things to you and make your heart joyful, to make your heart uh, gloriously joyful and happy and thankful in the world we live in today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus and the finished work of the cross. We thank you, Father, that uh, we do not have to be captive in the world today. We are pilgrims and strangers in this world, oh God. But it's here, it's all around us, it affects us, it can discourage us, it can uh, make us ashamed. There's so many consequences of the 
of the world we live in. And yet we thank you, Lord, that if we have your spirit working in our hearts, that we can be living testimonies, that we can be rejoicing each day, that we can uh, allow our hearts not to be troubled, but to believe in God and believe in the Lord Jesus. Thank you for this time together here. Bless us as we uh, fellowship together and bless the sermon or the message to follow and the service to follow. And Lord, we just uh, commit Ray to you right now as he is giving a gospel message. Bless those that hear that message and bless again your word as it goes out throughout the world today. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.